is now in session. Please be seated. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Introductions, please. Good afternoon. May it please the court. William Burton of Barnes and Thornburg. Uh, on behalf of Appley and Cross Appellant, guaranteed rate. With me today uh, are my partners, Lilith Asadorian and Aaron Lindstrom. Um, Ms. Asadorian will be arguing on behalf of guaranteed rate today. Welcome. Mr. Reed. Mr. Chief Justice, Justice Trainer, Justice Griffiths. It's a pleasure to be here. For the record, John Reed from DLA Piper on behalf of the appellant and cross appellee uh, Ace American Insurance Company. With me today is Bob Kassenstein from the Smith Kassenstein firm. We also have David Newman and Victoria Joseph from Hogan Lovells. Welcome. May it please the court. This is another appeal uh, involving entity coverage under a DNO policy. And the significance of this and other such cases really can't be underestimated. And by saying that, I don't mean to suggest in any way that the court doesn't take these cases seriously. So this let me explain. I think we've decided a lot of Abs coverage cases Absolutely. As and so let me, let, me, let me explain why I said that. So Delaware has often been referred to as a three-legged stool. Doesn't sound very flattering, but you could really think of us as some kind of rare and sturdy Chippendale, frankly. So the first leg, obviously, is corporation law. And generations of hard work, sound policy, and well-written uh, decisions has guided corporate America and has uh, enabled us to corner the market on incorporations. That volume of incorporations in Delaware has led to us being a, a leading jurisdiction in intellectual property and bankruptcies. Some would say, and I'm inclined to agree with them, that Delaware now has a fourth leg, and it is the insurance industry and insurance coverage litigation. The insurance industry relies heavily now uh, on our superior court to resolve uh, big ticket coverage cases, especially cases involving DNO policies. As Your Honor indicated, you've decided a lot of these cases now. For the insurance industry to be as comfortable with Delaware as corporate America is with Delaware, we have to continue to issue consistent and well-reasoned decisions because one wrong decision really can have a ripple effect across the country and across the industry because so many policies either have identical or very, very similar language. Uh, we respectfully submit that the trial court got this case wrong, and so let me just turn to the specifics. There are no facts in dispute with respect to the issues that we have raised. Guaranteed rate was in the business of originating and underwriting federally insured mortgages. Uh, originating and underwriting mortgages is professional services. GRI admits at A2796 of the record that it provides, quote, loan underwriting and originating, which may be characterized as professional services to its clients. The U.S. Department of Justice that it uh, investigated GRI for violations of the False Claims Act for its underwriting and origination practices that resulted in a $15 million settlement. And I want to go through these facts because I think it's important to set the stage and talk about the policy language before getting into the arguments. GRI then sought coverage under the DNO policy. I know the record here is close to 3,000 pages, but I'm probably only going to refer to about 10 pages, and I think, actually think this case can be decided by reference to only about 10 pages of the, the, of the record. Uh, the policy language is everything in these cases. So I want to start with the policy language. When the DNO policy was originally issued, section 3N2, which is at 847 of the record, excluded coverage for any claim, this is a quote from the policy, brought or maintained by or on behalf of or in the right of a customer or client, et cetera, et cetera. That section was then amended to exclude anything related to arising out of professional services. That amendment is at A869 of the record. Because liability in the rendering of professional services can arise in things well beyond actions brought by or on behalf of the client, the amendment completely deleted the original definition. And it, it replaced it with a new exclusion that excluded coverage for any claim related to professional services. It said, quote, alleging based upon arising out of or attributable to any insured's rendering or failure to render professional services. Now this language is clear, we submit. But if there is any doubt about the purpose of that amended exclusion, 
All you have to do is look at pages A913 and A914 of the record. Those pages contain correspondence between GRI's broker and Chubb, and they address 30, the 30 things that were being amended at the time. The important excerpt uh, is at 914 of the record. GRI's broker said this to Chubb about the new language. Exclusion N, too, is an absolute professional liability exclusion, assuming Chubb writes the ENO, which is an errors and emissions policy. We would like a generous carve back that states that this exclusion shall not apply to defense costs and failure to supervise. Chubb's response was unequivocal. The answer was this, quote, no, we will have an absolute professional services exclusion. And that's the language that they stuck with. They, all, they then said, also, they are purchasing a separate ENO policy. This could not be clearer. The exclusion was intended to, to bar anything arising out of professional services. Now, you may say at this point, because I, I did. How are we considering that if it's so clear? I mean, that's Well, I don't think you have to, Your Honor. You do not have to consider what I just walked through. All I'm saying is if there's any doubt about it, that seems to be pretty clear. But I think the language is clear. It contains broad arising out of language. Now, you may say to yourself, well, wait a minute, Mr. Reed, because I had this question myself when I looked at this. If professional services that GRI renders is originating underwriting mortgages, and if anything arising out of that is eliminated, what does this DNO policy cover? Um, so the answer to that is twofold. First, directors, officers, and the company would still be covered under the DNO policy for all types of claims, such as allegations by regulators or a receiver for accounting improprieties or mismanagement of funds, allegations of self-dealing transactions like a sale of an asset at an inadequate price, or personal use of funds, any of those things would be covered without any errors in the underwriting of mortgages. The second part of that answer uh, is what's discussed in item 18 in that correspondence that uh, went back and forth uh, between the broker and, uh, and Chubb. They, Chubb, in fact, issued an errors and emission policy. You can see it's, it's A1296 of the record where the, the language is quoted. And it defines professional services as mortgage banking and mortgage underwriting services and loan services for a fee. However, and this is the important part, the policy then had its own small exclusion, which expressly and very clearly excluded coverage for proceedings under the False Claims Act. It states that the policy excludes coverage for any claim quote, alleging, based upon, arising out of, or attributable to, or directly or indirectly resulting from a False Claims Act. While that poly policy language was in effect, the DOJ issued its investiga investigative demand, which is 917 of the record. This is what it states. It states that it's investigating GRA for violations of the False Claims Act by, quote, originating and underwriting federally insured mortgage loans that failed to meet applicable quality control requirements. When GRI settled with the DOJ, the settlement also contained a number of stipulations. Paragraph five of those stipulations is at A1215 of the record. It states, quote, GRI underwrote and originated certain release loans that did not meet the applicable program standards. Those facts and the policy language I walked through is all that's necessary to decide the issues we've raised. So, so, so what went wrong? In the face of an absolute bar to anything arising out of professional services under the DNO policy, and in the face of an express carve out for False Claims Act claims under the policy that actually covered professional services, the trial court nevertheless found coverage under the DNO policy. So the court granted coverage under the DNO policy that went beyond the coverage that was under the policy that was supposed to actually address professional services because of the False Claims Act carve out. Now, that's the big error view from 1,000 feet. Let me get into this, the specifics of this. Because we think the trial court erred in its opinion in several ways. Um, first, policy language is everything in these cases. And the trial court relied principally on a decision that interpreted different policy language. You can see this just by taking even a cursory review of the August 18th, uh, 2021 opinion below. The analysis is just four pages. 
And on page eight, it immediately starts off by discussing the Iberia Bank case. Now, the court did that because Iberia Bank involved a professional services policy issued by Chubb. And in Iberia Bank, Chubb successfully argued that False Claims Act allegations uh, arising from false statements to HUD were not professional services. So then at page nine of the opinion, the trial court said, wait a minute, you can't argue False Claims Act allegations are not professional services to avoid coverage in Iberia Bank, and then come to Delaware and now argue that False Claims Act allegations arise out of professional services for purposes of invoking the exclusion. And I'll tell you, at first blush, it has a lot of logical appeal. But the policy language, language isn't the same. And if you start to look at this, you see that that argument has no merit. Again, these cases turn on the precise language in the policy. And the definition of professional services in Iberia Bank did not contain the phrase arising out of. And it required the services to be performed by or on behalf of the insured for a policyholder or third party. That was narrower language. So coverage was properly excluded. In this case, the customer or client language was amended out of existence and replaced with an absolute bar. And we now have a rising out of language in our case. And as this court knows from the Eon Labs case, this is what the court said about arising out of. Quote, this is at page 893 of that opinion. The term arising out of is one that lends itself to uncomplicated common understanding. The court then held at page 894 that if there is, quote, some meaningful linkage, the phrase applies. So Iberia Bank is not inconsistent with the position we're taking here. It's just that the Iberia Bank case doesn't answer the question because the policy language is very different. Mr. Reed, I'm trying to <coughs> come to terms with the breadth or narrowness, as the case may be, of this arising out of language. And well, what, what, where, where is the line drawn? And let me give you a hypothetical. Uh, a loan originator from GRI is, is traveling to meet with a customer and uh, negligently injures someone along the way. Uh, it's clearly going to originate a loan. Uh, is that arising out of professional services under your interpretation of the policy? Well, I would say no, Your Honor. I would Why say, not? Well, I would say driving a car is sort of generic. It doesn't require the specialized type of knowledge that you would that would apply to the rendering of professional services. And you could have a car accident doing anything. There's nothing unique about it with respect to the rendering. It's not limited to the rendering of professional services. And look, I understand that these things can get kind of dicey in that regard. I just think this case is much clearer because we clearly had an absolute bar to anything related to professional services in the DNO policy. And we covered professional services in the ENO policy with a carve out for false claims act claims. And that's why this case should have simply said there's, there's no coverage here. And Maybe this will also, let me give you another example um, or a, a, a case along those lines. The second error by the trial court, we think, was its reliance upon uh, the Gallup uh, versus Greenwich Insurance case below uh, or, or from the Superior Court. That case involved False Claims Act allegations of overbilling and uh, fraudulent bill, billing practices. The court said at page 12 that fraudulent billing practices are not professional services. Now, I must say, uh, I'd like to think I have a lot of common sense. Um, that makes a lot of common sense to me because fraud in billing is fraud and it can occur in any context. Fraud is generic. It's not limited in any way to the rendering of professional services and it's not unique to professional services. One of the important things in the Gallup case too was that in Gallup the court was concerned about the fact that it had adopted the uh, interpretation advocated by the insurance company in that case. It would have completely eliminated any coverage under the policy, and it basically would have rendered it a nullity and it completely made it illusory and eliminated the whole purpose of having the policy in the first place. This case is different in several dispositive ways. First of all, this case does not involve fraud. Here the allegations are that GRI originated and underwrote mortgage loans that, quote, failed to meet applicable quality control standards. Settlement said the same thing. It's not generic fraud, that's a specific instance of malfeasance. It's a failure to meet the applicable standards related to the professional services they were rending. Also in the Gallup case, that was not a DNO policy. But perhaps the most important thing here is that um, this case, 
the policy was amended to completely eliminate anything related to professional services, while at the same time covering professional services under the DNO policy. So excluding False Claims Act allegations here doesn't render the DNO policy illusory or coverage illusory. It just enforces the narrow exception in the ENO policy. It doesn't erode coverage under the DNO policy, and they have professional services coverage under the ENO policy. They just don't have it for what the parties agreed would not be coverage for False Claims Act claims. Uh, the third error is on page 11 of the opinion below. There the trial court held against uh, ACE the fact that uh, DNO, the DNO policy does not define professional services. Now, I, I, this, in my view, the, the court just overlooked the fact that what professional services means is well established in the case law, and it's really not in dispute. We cite the cases on page 19 of our opening brief, but here's a quote uh, from page four of the Delaware Insurance Guarantee Association versus Birch case. Quote, the phrase professional services has been broadly defined as services involving specialized skill of a predominantly mental nature. Again, as I noted when going through the facts, there's no dispute that what was being rendered here were professional services. They admit it at page A2796 of the record. And again, the trial court's ruling ignored the absolute bar and the, and the elimination of the brought buyer on behalf of language when it was replaced with the arising out of language uh, in the amended exclusion. Let me turn to the fourth error. Page 11, the court held, and the court did this without any real analysis or citation, that, that quote, compliance with applicable quality control standards is not a professional services provided directly to borrower clients. Now, first of all, that ignored the fact that that customer or client language was eliminated in the amended exclusion. Um, but it also ignored the fact that uh, the, the $15 million settlement was calculated by determining the number of errors in the loans that GRI issued. And you can look at uh, A956 of the record uh, and A988 of the record to see that that's exactly what happened. And they, GRI even accepted the methodology used by the Department of Justice for calculating that settlement. I'd like now, to take you back to, uh, as you go through this, I'm reminded of your discussion of Gallup. Leave out fraud. What's the fundamental difference between a billing practice and a quality control practice? Oh, but so why should would they be viewed differently in relation to the issue? Before yes, um, can I get clarification? Am I is my total time three fifteen? I'm into my rebuttal time already. You are. If you uh, want to hold on to that, uh, no, I want to answer it very quickly. Okay. Um, Your Honor, there's a HUD handbook. It clearly sets forth in. It's a huge compilation of all the things that are required for purposes of issuing loans like this in this industry. Um, if you look at A1040 of the record, GRI even responded to the DOJ with respect to some of these things. What they did here was malfeasance in the rendering of the loans. And the fact that there may be other false things doesn't matter because there can be a number of but-for causes. We cite the Bostwick case from the United States Supreme Court uh, on this. and. If there's one but for cause that triggers the exclusion, uh, there's no coverage here. And there's no doubt, there's absolutely no doubt when you look at the record here that one of the reasons that the OJ initiated its investigation and the, the reason for the settlement was that there were errors, multiple errors, failure to meet the standards in rendering the professional services with regard to issuing loans. And with that, I think I will save my time. Thank you. Thank you. May it please the court. We are before the court today to answer one question. Is a claim under the False Claims Act a professional service? And we can answer that question by looking at the decades of jurisprudence that has been developed across all of the circuit courts. In fact, it is at the behest of the insurance industry that the 7th, 8th, 9th, and 10th circuits have looked at the question of whether or not 
claims under the False Claims Act count as professional services. For decades, the insurance, com insurance companies, including Chubb, have avoided liability for, for False Claims Acts by taking the position that there is a break in the causation chain between the underlying conduct and the False Claims Act that gives rise to liability to the government. And because of that break in the causation, the underlying professional services is ignored when considering whether or not the False Claims Act certifications and related liability find coverage in a professional liability policy. So the courts have held at looking at E&O policies that False Claims Act cases are not professional services. They do not, in fact, arise out of professional services, and they do not result from professional services. Um, and you can find authority for that in the Zurich case. You can find authority for that in the Health Industries case, and the other circuit court cases, Horizon and Jenkins. And each of those cases, the court analyzed the very same arising out of, resulting from, but for causation arguments that we're hearing my friend make today before the court and stated that even under broad language like that, they cannot find that the False Claims Act certifications and the liability associated with False Claims Act um, statutory remedies, they do not arise out of the underlying professional service. So what do we do with Mr. Reed's statement that you agree that it could be characterized as professional services. So what I heard Mr. Reed say is that guaranteed rate does not deny that the loan origination and underwriting process is professional services. And we agree with that. But that's not the question before the court. The question is whether the False Claims Act allegations are a separate conduct that need to be reviewed apart from the underlying professional services. And that's really the question, right? It's not, is loan origination and underwriting a professional services? Everybody agrees that that is a quote unquote professional service. But the allegations here are not about the professional service. The False Claims Act elements are, you have to present a fraudulent claim to the government with the intent to defraud the government. Th those are the only elements of a False Claims Act claim. It doesn't, and that, that's because it crosses all industries. And as we see in the circuit court cases, this can involve nursing home practices, it can involve billing practices, as we see in Gallup, it can involve you know, separate billing practices. So there's, there's all kinds of industries that are implicated by the False Claims Act. And in every one of the cases where the False Claims Act is evaluated for coverage, and this has been helpful to the insurance industry. It's created certainty for them, and it's the right outcome that these are not professional services. Making representations to the government and asking for some sort of reimbursement from the government is a separate conduct that is viewed independently of the underlying professional services. And why is that? Well, we talk about the modifications in the DNO exclusion, right? And, and um, Mr. Reed argued that it was an absolute professional services exclusion. Well, to create certainty for an insured, we need to understand how that's being interpreted. And he offered some examples of what would still be covered. Well, I offer that his examples actually would not be covered if we were to accept the broad arising out of but for causation argument that Chubb is making. Because the way we, um, understand the policy and the way they understand the policy is very different. And if there's any ambiguity into how the exclusion should be interpreted, it's their burden to demonstrate to the court that there is absolute certainty with respect to how the exclusion should be applied. Because that is how insurance policies need to be interpreted. And I offer that the alternative interpretation is that in the case of a False Claims Act, we have to follow what the circuit courts say is the right way to look at the False Claims Act. And the right way to look at the False Claims Act is that it is a separate act that is removed from the underlying professional services. And the purpose for the exclusion 
is something narrower. So for example, Guaranteed Rate bought both a professional liability policy and a director's and officer's policy together. And was, as we know, many companies do that because those two policies are meant to be complementary to one another, right? So what is covered in your director's and officer's policy is not covered under your professional liability policy and vice versa. So when you have a professional liability exclusion in a director's and officer's policy, what you're really looking to do is make sure that you know, claims by um, customers or counterparties for negligent performance of your services, professional liability, professional negligence, those are the things that the director's and officer's policy is trying to exclude with the professional services exclusion. The intent is not to exclude government claims for false claims acts. That is not the intent of the exclusion. And that reasonable interpretation is confirmed by Chubb's own statements in the Iberia Bank briefing that had nothing to do with interpretation of the policy language there. If I may quote, for example, Chubb stated more than once in the briefing in Iberia Bank, that the conduct that lay at the heart of the government's false claims act are the false certifications to the government, not the origination or underwriting. In the Fifth Circuit, almost simultaneously as they were denying coverage to guaranteed rate, Chubb was making the following statements to the Fifth Circuit. The submission of false claims to the government to, the re to receive a benefit cannot be considered professional services. So simultaneously, and this goes to our bad faith case, simultaneously while they were taking the position with guaranteed rate that we must focus on the underwriting and the origination, they were making statements to the Fifth Circuit, which ultimately led to the correct conclusion that the submission of false claims to the government under the False Claims Act to receive a benefit cannot be considered professional services. So very difficult to reconcile those two provisions, right? And very difficult to reconcile those two positions in the context of um, the competing circuit court cases. And let's take a look at Gallup, which is the, the you know, Mr. Reed said it's not a director's and officer's case. It is, in fact, a director's and officer's case. And there was a professional services exclusion there very much like here, where the court considered whether or not the exclusion barred coverage for False Claims Act cases. Um, and the court looked at the exclusion and said, the exclusion is too broad, it is too ambiguous, we don't know what you're trying to uh, ascertain here, we don't know what you're trying to bar, and therefore we're going to allow for the claim to be covered because the insurer carries the burden of demonstrating the uh, preciseness of the exclusion. But Go ahead. No. Yes. Go ahead. Isn't the policy language a lot different in Gallup than it is here? Um, it is not that different in, than it is here because um, if we were to accept the broad interpretation that Chubb is advocating, so the policy language here, um, which now I don't have in front of me, but the policy language here basically says that anything that arises out of professional services is is therefore excluded. I mean, gu guaranteed rates entire business is originating mortgage loans and underwriting mortgage loans. So you could drive anything through that exclusion. If you say, you know, a, a claim, he mentioned a claim by the government. Well, this is a claim by the government. So is it or is it not arising out of professional services? How can we ever tell? But doesn't a government investigation have a meaningful link to originating and underwriting loans? It depends on the government investigation, right? So, it, and I don't know what the answer to that is. Apparently, you know, Chubb will tell us if that arises and how they decide to um, apply the exclusion. Certainly the Falls Claims Act. We, we see from the circuit courts, they look at the same arising out of and the same but for causation. And the circuit courts say, no, it doesn't. It doesn't have the meaningful linkage. There's a break in the causation chain when it comes to the False Claims Act. Now, if it's a different sort of government investigation, let's say the CFPB was investigating guaranteed rate, and the CFPB came and said, you know, we think you're fooling your borrowers and you're charging them too high of an interest rate. And if we tender that to the directors and officers policy, 
would Chubb come back and say, well, that arises out of your loan originations to, the, to borrowers, right? So then that would be excluded. Would that find coverage within this exclusion? I don't think so. Not the way Chubb is advocating because it could easily be said that that arises out of the professional services of lending money to borrowers. So I, I have difficulty finding a situation where the exclusion would not apply. So um, you would also argue, I guess, that the carve out for False Claims Act in the E&O policy is consistent with your argument because you didn't want double recovery under both policies, so it should be covered under the DNO policy, right? That's right. And, you know, to some extent, given the argument of the insurance industry and Chubb itself that False Claims Act are not professional services, you know, maybe that's ex that exclusion isn't even necessary because the law says professional liability policies don't cover False Claims Act cases. So the logical conclusion is, and they knew how to use a False Claims Act exclusion. Clearly, they put it on the Arizona emissions policy, right? So if they wanted to make it crystal clear to the insured purchasing this policy that, oh, by the way, we also mean that this doesn't extend to False Claims Act cases. This policy will not cover False Claims Act cases. They could have added the very same exclusion to the director's and officer's policy, but they didn't do that. Should we be looking at the history of the negotiations of the policy? I don't think it's relevant. I mean, it, and the only way it's it's relevant is, is if they're if they're agreeing is that the provision is ambiguous. And if they're agreeing that the provision is ambiguous and we can offer an alternative reasonable construction, then under insurance interpretation rules that favor the insured, the outcome is in favor of coverage. I mean, I get how we can look at the E&O policy because if you look at Chicago Bridge, that case, for instance, we said, you know, it's important to look at mm -hmm. the commercial context in which these policies operate so you can look at how there's an E&O and a D&O policy. But I'm just wondering about if nobody is claiming that there's ambiguity here, how we rely on the negotiating history of the policy. You know, I, I don't I don't believe you, we should be including the negotiating history of the policy. Um, but if we are going to include the negotiating history of the policy at their behest, then I think that's an admission of ambiguity. And if it's an admission of ambiguity, then we win because ambiguity is resolved in the favor of coverage. If there's more than one reasonable interpretation, we've offered a reasonable interpretation. They agree with that reasonable interpretation as we've seen in the statements that they've made in the Iberia Bank case that False Claims Act cases are not professional services. And they make that blanket statement irrespective and unmoored to any language in you know the Iberia Bank policy or any other policies that are being considered by the circuit courts. In fact, in Zurich, the same arising out of language appeared there in the insuring agreement. And the Tenth Circuit said, despite the arising out of language, we find that the False Claims Act allegations have to be reviewed separately and irrespective of the underlying professional services that, that are the basis of the conduct. And they, they say that there's an intervening cause, and that is why um, the but-for analysis weighs in favor of finding a, uh, the False Claims Act as being separate and apart from the underlying professional services. When you, when you start your argument about you know, professional services being directly provided to the borrowers, do you have certain cases that where that is where you have, you find that support for we do your honor and we quoted them in our briefs where we talk about the fact that even the cases they rely on where they say well the language here you know they, they started their argument by saying <clears throat> there was a change in the exclusion and the for customer language was yeah. removed right and, and they cite to a number of cases for that proposition that you know there's a breath here that we need to consider and we respond by saying even in those cases that talk about you know what are professional services inevitably whether or not the language for customer exists every one of those cases are talking about conduct that's performed for a fee to a third party so 
whether that's your customer or a counterparty, when you think about professional services, it's always a service that you perform for somebody in return for some fee, right? That, that is the exchange of services. So it always has to be services that you're providing to some third party for a cost. Whether or not that language appears in the exclusion is really irrelevant because at the end of the day, what you're trying to do is exclude liability for broad professional negligence. And what gives rise to broad professional negligence? It's the services you perform for a third party. And if I may turn um, very quickly to our bad faith argument, we think that the court erred in uh, rejecting the uh, bad faith expert report that we presented, which laid out the industry standards that are appropriate for insurance claims handling. Uh, we believe that um, Chubb is liable for bad faith based on at least four separate grounds. Chubb refused to accept the CID as a claim when it knew it had no basis for taking that position, and it adopted a artificial and tortured position to avoid coverage for the CID when it was first presented for coverage. It failed to conduct an unbiased, thorough, and timely investigation. Clearly, its denial based on this exclusion was unreasonable given the simultaneous and um, contravening positions it was taking in the Iberia Bank case at the same time that it was denying coverage to guaranteed rate. Um, and Chubb refused to advance defense costs on baseless grounds. And we believe that there are enough tribal issues of fact to allow a jury to determine whether or not that conduct was in bad faith. And if there are no other questions, I will close. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I think I got this in two minutes. I, I understand, I think, what the court's focusing on. And let me, let me make three points here about the, the relationship between the policy language. There is an exclusion in the e o policy that covers professional services for false claims act claims. There's no bright line about all false claims act claims being completely excluded from the notion of professional services. They talk about these circuit court cases, the Zurich case, let me read a quote from page 921 of the Zurich versus O'Hara case. Quote, the problem was not the actual level of services provided to O'Hara's patients, but that O'Hara billed for services it did not provide. Our case is very different. First of all, our policy language says anything based upon, arising out of, is excluded professional services is excluded. There's no doubt here that the failure here was a failure to meet applicable standards. The standards that provide applied to the professional services, it wasn't false billing. It wasn't billing for services you didn't provide. It was for errors in the services that you did provide. I don't know how you could say that there is no meaningful linkage between a DOJ investigation and meaningful linkage is the Eon Labs language from, from this court. How you could say that there's no meaningful linkage between the DOA, DOJ's investigation and ultimate settlement for errors or omissions um, with respect to a failure to meet, quote, applicable program requirements. That is malfeasance in the rendering of professional services. Clearly, the DOJ investigation and settlement arose out of it. There may be other causes. I mean, there may be false statements in relation to that. But clearly that's satisfied. Um, on the cross appeal, I, I just want to make one point. You know, the standard is a lack of reasonable justification uh, to, to give rise to a bad faith claim. That's the RSUI uh, case. Uh, I, I, I would respectfully submit that I don't think any of the arguments I've made here today were frivolous or in bad faith. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think they were, they're meritorious. You're out of time. Oh, Thank you very much. I'm sorry, Your Honor. Thank you. Do you have anything uh, you want to? Just one quick point, Your Honor. Sure. She gets the last word because of the cross appeal. One additional point to make, Your Honor, and this goes to the bad faith case as well. Well, this has to be limited to yes, the bad Yes, exactly. Faith case. So the allegations that the government made went far beyond just the underwriting, and this is something that Chubb knew at the time when it was denying coverage. They went to a quality control program. The GRI was required to provide and implement under the HUD rules that it did not do so. Um, according to the government, 
It went to the commissions that were paid to employees and underwriters that the government viewed as creating a conflict of interest. It went to how they managed their computer systems and whether all information was accessible to everybody. It went to management exceptions that were made um, in the uh, origination and certification process. So there were a number of components of the government's case that were actually separate and apart from the underwriting. And Chubb knew about this at the time that it was denying the uh, coverage based on the professional services exclusion. Uh, in addition, the CID, when Chubb denied the CID, it deliberately, when it wrote to the insured, removed language, policy language, from that letter in order to, we believe, um, confuse the insured into believing that there was no coverage. When in fact, uh, the claim definition number six clearly states that a government investigation would have been covered. And they deliberately removed that language when they sent a letter to the, uh, to the insured so that the insured didn't understand that there was actually coverage. So we believe all of those are not reasonably justified and should go to a jury. Thank you. Thank you very much, counsel. We'll take the matter under advisement. Please recess the court. Please rise. Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. All men are persons having anything before the Supreme Court in the state of Delaware ring out the part and give their attendance to the call of the court. The court is now adjourned. God save the state and the honorable court.